I am Femi OK and you're in the stream. Ghana's economy has been crippled by the impact of the COVID pandemic, rampant inflation, the war in Ukraine, plus a depreciating currency. Now analysts are warning that the country is close to a crisis. Have a listen to Sami Jemfi. His organisation led protests in the capital Accra last month. For the first time in the history of this fourth republic, the rate of inflation is hovering around 27-28%. That is unprecedented. And that should tell you about the persistent and astronomical hikes in the prices of food especially and other basic commodities. So today the ordinary Ghanaian is struggling to afford three square meals a day. Not even two square meals a day because we are suffering. So Ghana's economic crisis is what we're looking at today. We have a panel of experts. Let's say hello to Yvonne and Mensa and Theo. Good to have all of you on board. Yvonne, please introduce yourself to our audience around the world. Hello, Yvonne. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Go Hi. ahead. Hi, um, I'm Yvonne Mohango, Africa economist at the nation's capital. Good to have you. Mensa, welcome to the stream. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Thank you very much. My name is Mensa Thompson. I lead one of the most vibrant anti-corruption civil society organizations in Ghana. And I'm also a leading member for Arise Ghana, which is an amalgamation of a number of interest groups that have come together to express major concern about Ghana's current economic situation. All right, very good. And finally, Theo, welcome to the stream. Please introduce yourself to our international audience. All right, so we don't hear Theo very carefully, but very, very well. But I will tell you that Theo is an economist and a political risk analyst. We will try and connect him back in just a moment. I want to take you to the market in Accra about a month ago. That's when Al Jazeera was out in Ghana reporting. Just to get some grassroots economy and economic um, feedback from some people who know when the price My of food has gone machine. up and when it's gone down. Let's have a listen. These days, things are so, so expensive. The prices are outrageous and it's, it's serious. It's, it's serious. We are crying out loud to the government to do something about it. I cannot buy, so I'm going. Because I'm having a cities and she said 16 cities and I cannot afford it. At first, I, it was a cities and now it's 16 cities, so times two. So I, I don't know what to do about it. Mensa, are you surprised to hear those opinions by ladies in the market? Like, we can't afford these prices. How would you explain to our international audience what's going on? Absolutely not. I'm not, su I'm not surprised. Um, the, the warning signs has been there for the past two years. It only became aggravated uh, this past few weeks when now the people are beginning to realise that, hey, um, we are in austerity and uh, people are beginning to uh, actually embrace the reality which uh, a lot of experts and analysts and, and uh, economic watchers have been have been sounding for quite some time now and we are here uh, due to a number of issues which uh, from our estimation have very little to do with the global uh, economic climates, uh, i.e. the Russian-Ukrainian war, which you alluded to. Yeah. Uh, as far back as 2020, analysts so, have been warning the government... So, so, so Mensa, if you, if you say that Ghana's issues are not connected to a couple of things that is impacting not just um, other African neighbours, but also the whole world. So, uh, Ukraine crisis uh, right now. Food has gone up and fuel has gone up around the whole world. Ghana's immune to that. That's not a problem for Ghana either. It is. It is to a very large extent. All right. But um, there are other neighboring countries who have also been hit uh, by this same global crisis, but not at the, at the extent or degree which Ghana has been affected. And uh, Ghana, you know our performance on, on in the sub-region when it comes to economic issues. We are more like the buffer for the region. And so a lot of countries look up to us. Uh, and we, we are of the firm belief that uh, if 
there was prudent economic management in the past two years. Ah. The level of impact this global due uh, economic climate would have had on our larger economy would have been less severe than we are witnessing. Um, so you so so, so 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 Mensa, hold hold a tight one for a moment. I just want to bring back in Theo here. Um, so so Theo, what Mensa is saying that it's not these outside circumstances like COVID and uh, Ukraine and the Russia conflict. It's not that that's Ghana's essential problem. It's bad management, bad government. Theo. Um, um, absolutely, because there are actually two factors here. There's the external shocks, which um, Sami um, has actually uh, discussed or uh, referenced, but internally there are also domestic factors that need to be taken into account here. So even before Russia, Ukraine, and also uh, with COVID, uh, the government had literally been uh, on a dead bench with uh, a lot of borrowing, which was adding on to the public debt, and the warning signs somewhat were there. So in, to an extent, it's actually a mixture of two things. Mm -hmm. What is happening? All right. So, so once again, our challenge is not just the economy in Ghana, but also our challenge is actually keying Theo. Theo, some of the, the thoughts that we are getting from our online community who are watching right now on YouTube, and I'm going to share this with Mensa as well. So Mensa, um, on YouTube, our audience are wondering, well, isn't this just corruption in Ghana? And I have to say, as a Nigerian, I look to next door neighbor Ghana and I also think that it's like the standard. You set the standard high. How can you be in trouble in Ghana? Is it corruption? Extremely. And I think that uh, the kind of corruption we're witnessing now, uh, to a very large extent, um, is pretty much unprecedented. And um, for, for the past few days, we've seen a lot of you know, global um, internal reports being churned out by other um, development groups who are raising the concern about the massive corruption. And the problem with the corruption in Ghana at this moment is the, the brazen act of corruption and also the response from the government point of view. And we believe that it drives a lot of confidence away from the system because uh, the capital markets and the global uh, 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 international players who are looking at Ghana, who are looking at how to help Ghana resolve its economic difficulties, are seeing these brazen acts of corruption that are being perpetrated every now and then, and they see very little action being taken. And so now people uh, become quite nervous about even lending to Ghana because they know that a huge chunk of these monies are going to be uh, dissipated through corruption. And the lack of political will and the sheer encouragement of corruption at the top level of governance, i.e. the presidency, is what is of major concern. And uh, for, for the past few days, the presidents have come and that... Okay major criticisms over his confidence and his approach to the fight against corruption, who, which analysts have described him in a certain manner of uh, names, which I don't want to repeat. Right. On, on, on all, right so I, I, scale, but... all right. Let me just bring in Yvonne so you don't have to repeat yourself. Yvonne, I'm just looking here at some of the, the thoughts I've been getting in from Twitter. So inflation mm. is currently at 29% roughly. Uh, fuel, food and transportation are at an all-time high. But in 2019, mm. I know that you were talking to IMF who were visiting Ghana at that time, and it was a very rosy picture. Mm. Can I ask what went wrong, or, or is that the right question? What is the right line of thought here, Yvonne, from your perspective? I think a big reason Ghana finds itself in this position today is the uh, crisis that have um, befallen the country since uh, 2020. So COVID, first of all, and now the Ukrainian invasion. As you rightly mentioned, um, I was in um, Accra early 2020. Um, at the time, the country or uh, the current administration had managed to bring down their budget deficit into the low single digits as a share of GDP. Um, I remember early that year, the Ghanaian CD was one of the best performing currencies um, in the world, and the IMF had nothing but positive things to say about the country. Mm -hmm. And of course, a month later, we had the pandemic hit. So I do believe that a lot of what they're experiencing today is due to external um, 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 events that have led to the fiscal uh, situation deteriorating so dramatically. All right, so Mr. Kessa here on, on Twitter says this, Yvonne. If you cast your mind back to the 90s and early 2000s, one could see a pattern. Three key things stand out for Ghana's current economic woes. Lack of leadership, 
wrong social intervention and corruption. Do you agree with any of those three points? <laughs> Uh, corruption is not endemic to Ghana, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the um, um, uh, characteristics of Ghana that's been disappointing, particularly for the investors that we do speak to, is the fact that these fiscal crises seem to be recurring. Typically, though, they do occur in the run-up to an election. And as we know, Ghana has a four-year cycle. So when the current administration came into office in 2016, they had to clean up the fiscal uh, situation and bring down a deficit uh, uh, dramatically. Our, as I mentioned earlier, the current uh, um, fiscal situation the current it finds itself in, which is resulting in these austere uh, measures on the ground, is due to external um, factors comba compounding the, um, the current vulnerabilities in the um, economy. But I do take um, um, the um, um, person on Twitter's yeah. uh, comments um, quite well. Yeah, he is correct. All right, so let's bring in uh, Ghana's Minister of Finance. Ghana, earlier on this year, was adamant that they were not going to call in the International Monetary Fund. They were not. They could deal with their problems themselves. Here's a little clip so you can hear how passionate the Minister of Finance was about not contacting the IMF. We are not going to the IMF. Whatever we do, we are not. The consequences are there. We are a proud nation. We have the resources. We have the capacity. Don't let anybody tell you. Dio, what happened? I am not going to the IMF. And then July the 1st, the IMF team in Accra trying to work out how to help Ghana again. I think politically it was a difficult one for this administration, uh, largely because the, the rhetoric um, before going to the IMF and even before they came into power was that they had bastardized the, the then administration for making a similar move on the basis of what one could argue were uh, also external shocks, uh, i.e. the slowdown in China and, and related matters. Um, but some of us actually did indicate that the direction in which the economy was traveling and the way things were being managed, including things to do with corruption, which would manifest in things like the award of public contracts, was ultimately going to lead us to uh, a ditch and a place where you have no other option but to seek the, the IMF. And I kind of like to slightly disagree with Yvonne uh, on, the, on the root causes. So for sure, Russia, Ukraine um, did play a part and COVID did play a part. Uh, but if you actually look at the trajectory and the numbers, including the assessment that had been done by others like the World Bank, et cetera, we were already at risk of high debt risk distress for the country's external debt, but also the overall debt levels. And this was even before Russia, Ukraine, and before the, the pandemic. So in a sense, it's actually two core factors. The external factors, which we've described, yep. but importantly, it being compounded by the weak um, governance and across the board fiscal indiscipline of the of the government. That's what has led All right. us. So let me tell you. Let me tell yeah. you on on YouTube. This is how Christy Lemon describes uh, how you describe quite. Um, I'm just going to say politely. Christy says, "Akufo Addo is a failure and a bad leader." That is coming from our gross grassroots comments on YouTube. Uh, guess I'm going to get you to engage with some of the commentary that we're hearing, but very quickly so we can get in as much as possible. So um, this one is for you, Mensa. Why IMF? Aren't there any other options? Mensa, quick response in 30 seconds. Well, there are a number of options, but we believe that IMF, the IMF would be a short-term remedy to putting us back on some fiscal recovery of the economy. But the huge chunk of the long-term uh, recovery, which cannot be given by the IMF, the IMF cannot fight corruption for us. The IMF cannot help us to be food sufficient. There are certain decisions that would have to be taken at the, at the governance level, at okay. the leadership level, and it takes a lot of political will to do that. All right. Yvonne, I'm going to put this one to you. This one's from Tiffany. Tiffany, thank you for watching. Appreciate you. At this point, Ghana has no choice, Yvonne. It's either IMF bailout or society breakdown and severe famine. Is that too extreme from Tiffany? Thoughts, Yvonne? Um, well, given the indebtedness we are seeing globally at many uh, fear that um, if Ghana did not engage the IMF, they would go the Sri Lanka route. 
Um, so mm -hmm. I do think it's a positive that they've engaged the IMF. Um, it does, aside from provide that endorsement that the IMF does to other uh, financiers, it does, um, if there is a program that follows um, their discussions, it does open up, uh, reopen access to external financing, which is what Ghana needs at this point in time. All right, so one more from William. This is on YouTube. I'm going to put this one to you, Tio. Very fast response, please. Uh, we need to move from a consumer to a producing society. There's too much dependence on exported goods coupled with corruption. That's not a good combination. Tio, quick response. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, in terms of fixing the problem, the structural issues really have to do with what you grow and eating what you grow. And to that extent, we need to uh, grow up the, the productive base of the economy, particularly agriculture and value-added manufacturing. Uh, but that's a long-term project that needs to be collectively worked on uh, by all the political parties. OK. Mensa, what did you just write down? I can see you out of the corner of my eye. I hope it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Dish, tell us. Yes, I think uh, not to tie in what Dr few said with the fears and uh, with the strong resolve in the past by Ghana's finance minister that we're, go we're not going to go to the IMF. I mean, part of that reason is about um, the bad financial reports and that have been seen under this uh, current finance minister who has been cooking his financial figures, who has been misreporting Ghana's economic in in data to the international market and other people uh, just to create the impression as if we were doing well. Uh, when actually our economy was sinking. That's why it was too late for a lot of us, for a lot of okay. people to see it, and also uh, for a lot of the interventions coming in late because of the fear that some of these data which they had manipulated could be found out by the international players. I'm just looking, I'm going to show some of our audience, our viewers, some of the protest video uh, that we recorded when Al Jazeera was reporting in Accra a few weeks ago. What does this mean, Yvonne, when you see people out on the streets protesting against their government's fiscal policies. What does that tell you? Um, that the current policies are not working. Um, I must also, though, add that we are seeing several protests um, throughout the frontier markets and emerging markets. Uh, this is not just specific to Ghana. Part of this, of course, is a reflection of the uh, dramatic increase we've seen of commodity prices, in particular fuel, food and fertilizers, which I don't think is specific uh, to Ghana in itself. But all of that said, um, uh, the responsibility of government is to try and mitigate the impact um, of those um, price increases uh, through uh, various policies. Um, the, the thing is, though, what we face in a lot of African countries is the buffers are not there or uh, in terms of the, the fiscal space that's available in order to put in the mitigating measures is limited in the case of um, Ghana. And I guess that's part of the reason they've uh, approached the IMF. Mm -hmm. I'm going to... Yes, yes, Mensa, go ahead. Yes, I totally disagree. Ivan, I think we are down here. We know exactly what has been going on for the last uh, couple of years that has led us to this stage. Yes, we know the global climate and all those. We know that these protests and these hardships are not uh, um, limited to only Ghana. Uh, but you, you, you do acknowledge that Ghana has been a rising example uh, to some, some few years ago where one, one of the fastest growing economies were doing pretty much better. And so the question should be answered, how did we decline? I don't think, obviously, it, this can be alluded to these uh, international shocks, which you've so much over elaborated. I think that uh, the, the, the management level, the, the kind of governance that the people of Ghana have been sent with in the last four years has been very bad, has been very uh, abysmal, and everything pointed out to this particular outcome. With or without, without Russia-Ukrainian war, without COVID-19, Ghana will still be talking to the IMF today because of this bad management, mm. corruption, and the, and, and, and the current attitude of leadership that we've been served with. Yvonne, is that something that you could see in the future? Because in 2020, you were looking at a, a better future for Ghana. Just a I, brief I answer, because I'm going to move question. on to what do, we, yeah. what do we do next? OK, go ahead, Yvonne. Okay, so no, no, my question uh, uh, for Sam uh, was to ask if in, in the first term of this administration from 2016 uh, to 2019, did we not see the uh, budget deficit being narrowed uh, substantially in the case of, of uh, Ghana? It, it's, it's as though 
the, my, the impression is that uh, Ghana at this point Ivan, in time is being judged IMF. based on what has happened in the, the, and the economy since 2020. Yes, based on the data the finance minister has presented. You remember just a few years ago, the IMF had come to tell us that our deficit figures were not accurate because some two huge components of the budget had been treated as below the line, which is I the see. energy so sector payments and, 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 and also the, the banking sector Mensa. payments. Which, and Yvonne, which, I'm, I'm going to pause you just, just for a moment because I want to bring in another thought here and also some ideas. But I'm just going to tell our audience that this IMF bailout, if it happens, will be the 18th in Ghana's history. So Ghana repeatedly is asking for help, financial help, from outside. This is not unusual for countries, but for Ghana, this is 18th time with the IMF in particular. Let us move forward a little bit. Thea, I know that you have some ideas and some solutions. I'm going to go via David Your Morley, who has some ideas about how Ghana gets out of this current situation. He's very sceptical about the IMF. Have a listen to David and then share some of your own ideas too. Theo, this is for you. Here's David first of all. As it stands now, our debt to GDP ratio is about 97%. So the IMF can never be a solution. They also uh, bring on board policies that will lead to retrenchment of workers. They also de-industrialize your economy. So the IMF can never be a solution. The solutions are right here with us. Let's uh, uh, block the leakages in our tax generating mechanisms. Let's reduce the amount of money we give to foreign companies in the name of tax incentives. Let's reduce corruption. Let's reduce the size of government. If we're able to do all this, and I think we can move our country forward. So just a quick correction to David's points. The debt, debt to GDP ratio is actually now around 78%, 78%. and not 97%. Uh, but I do agree with a lot of the points he's made. But I think fundamentally the starting point is for Ghana to actually agree a debt restructuring program as part of the IMF program, you know, with its uh, creditors. And this could be done under the, the G20 framework, you know, um, and it will give the country much, much uh, needed uh, space. Secondly, a lot of the points that David alluded to, which is that there's a lot of waste, there's, there's a lot of, you know, um, uh, wasted within how we run the government machinery and where you could actually then argue that the people that we appoint, the size of government, the ministers and all the largers needs to be cut down. Uh, within that also, you need to actually implement the structural reforms that we agreed to. If you actually look at the last program that Ghana signed on to, many of the program areas which we said we would commit to, including reforming the payroll system, getting rid of pay, um, ghost workers, et cetera. That was not done. Um, and, you know, if you don't do that, you will come back to the same issues. Thirdly, I think the issue really has to do with growing the economy. And an important point related to that, by which also Yvonne and um, Sami did allude to, is that part of the inflation issues we're seeing now actually is to do with the central bank deficit financing of the budget, where they are literally printing a little bit more money and engage in external operations, which is spiking or driving the inflation. So it's not just really due to Russia, Ukraine, and the effect of uh, COVID. That is there, okay. but there are much, much more deeper issues that underpin where we are now uh, as a country. Because if you look around all across the sub-region, even, you know, nice next door, Côte d'Ivoire, et cetera, you don't see similar issues, you know, at play in that regard. All right, let me, let yes, me go okay. to thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to share the final moments of our show with our YouTube audience because you have so much to say, uh, many of you. So, uh, Amos, government must reduce corruption. The unnecessary government spending is too much. Let's stop all of this and see our nation develop. Uh, economic for um, even if the expected IMF programme comes with the much-needed balance of payment support, Ghana will still have to restructure its expenditure through fiscal contingency measures. So much wisdom in the YouTube comments. I hope the government of Ghana is watching this show. Thank you so much for being part of the program. Theo, Mensa, and Yvonne and all of our viewers on YouTube appreciate you. I'll see you next time. Take care.
because you came to meet 